Hi, AP Chem students. This is Mrs. Johnson. We are starting with the Chapter 12 notes on kinetics. So hopefully you've already done the FET simulation, um, looking at particles colliding, because that's where we're going to start off here with the notes. If you're looking at your textbook, um, this stuff is actually towards the end of the chapter. The textbook starts off with the math-heavy stuff first, and then more conceptual things. And I'm kind of flip-flopping it for our class. So we are starting off with collision theory of reaction rates. And we know that molecules are colliding during... Um, during chemical reactions. But what we don't tend to think about is how often those actual collisions result in rearranging the molecules to form products. And what we find is that not many collisions are quote unquote successful. So most of the time molecules just hit each other and bounce back and there's no product formed. So a very small portion of the collisions are successful. In order to be successful, we have to meet two criteria. And the first one is that the molecules have to hit each other with the appropriate orientation. This is not something we often think about. Um, but if two molecules hit each other, but it's not in the areas where the bonds are most likely to rearrange or whatever, that's not a successful collision. Um, and the orientation that is appropriate just depends on the types of molecules that are colliding. Uh, the second criteria is that they have to have enough energy when they collide in order to overcome the Coulombic attractions of the, the reactant molecules. That amount of energy that must be present when the two molecules collide is known as the activation energy. Um, if, if molecules collide with the appropriate orientation and have enough energy uh, when they collide, then the bonds are going to reform to make products. And that's what we see in the graph over here. So this is an energy profile. We've got reaction progress on the x-axis and then the energy increasing on the y-axis. So this point is the activation energy or the, uh, the amount of energy that they must have when they hit each other. And then during successful collisions, translational energy, and that's just molecules moving in a, in a straight line towards each other, it's converted into vibrational energy. Remember um, from our discussion of different types of energy in molecules, vibrational energy is talking about um, the actual bonds between the molecules. So that should make sense that molecules moving towards each other, their energy gets converted into the type of energy that's going to, to break or reform the uh, bonds, so electron rearrangement. And then when those two molecules come together to hit, we if you could just take a snapshot of that moment, the two molecules colliding, what you might envision is that you have this sort of large molecule almost, and that's called the transition state, which is what we see in the graph here, or the activation complex. We would call that the activated molecule, I guess. Um, so it's a really high energy at that point, and that should make sense because it's very unstable. It's either going to fall down to become a product or fall back this way to become a reactant. So you must know that this is the transition state. All right, and now using Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions to represent collisions. If you remember back to our discussion of gases, uh, we did a lot with Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions, and we can actually apply those same sorts of graphs to um, reactions. So we're going to see these again in this chapter. And if you remember, Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions show uh, the energy distribution on the x-axis versus the number of particles in your sample on the y-axis. So what we see here, remember, as you increase the temperature, we get a shift in the graph. So the hump sort of levels out, and we see more molecules with a higher energy. But remember, in a sample, we report the average temperature, and even though there's a wide range of temperature. Very small amounts of molecules have the highest temperatures. Anyway, that's your review of Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions. Here's how we're going to apply it to kinetics. If we mark on this graph the point of activation energy along our x-axis, we, just a side note, we call activation energy E sub A, so this should actually be a subscript A. Only the particles on the right side of this activation energy line are, have enough energy to collide um, with enough force to actually create the products. So only to the right of the activation energy mark will react when they collide. If you increase the temperature, let's think about what happens. We see the lessening hump. We see more molecules on the right side of this line because increase the temperature, increase the kinetic energy. So that, thus, we are going to have an increase in reaction rate. 
Um, if we get more molecules colliding, it's more likely that we'll have more successful collisions, so the reaction rate increases. And that should make sense. You would definitely want to be able to answer um, questions about this. If you were just given a graph like this in any context, you should be able to tell me which of these two um, curves represents a higher temperature. Um, and we should know that it's actually T2, even though it has the lower hump, we have more particles at the, the greater energy. So don't get tricked by that if you saw it in a, in a multiple choice question. All right, factors that affect reaction rates. I'll try to go through these super quickly. Um, a lot of these are just totally common sense. I want you to have them all in one spot, though. So phase of reactants. Solids are going to react much more slowly than liquids or aqueous solutions, and that should make sense. The particles are, are more locked in place than they are in a liquid or a solution. If we grind a solid, though, we're going to increase the surface area, and that actually increases the reaction rate. And here's an example. If we had potassium sulfate and barium nitrate, solids, and we put them in a container together, we're not going to see a reaction. However, we put all that in aqueous solution, and very rapidly you'll see a precipitate form as these two um, molecules interact. The chemical identity obviously makes a difference in the reaction rate. So substances that have really strong bonds, and those are ones with high bond energies, they're going to react more slowly, and that should make sense to us. Um, usually ions that have opposite charges are going to react rapidly. They're more likely to, to hit each other. Um, so that should make sense as well. And then the more bonds between reacting atoms in a molecule, the slower the reaction rate. So if you have a molecule with a lot of bonds that you're trying to break up in order to form your products, that's going to take um, more energy and more time as well. You've got to have a lot more collisions in the right orientation in order to do that. The concentration of reactants, we kind of talked about this a little bit on Wednesday. The more molecules present, the more collisions that we have occurring, so the faster the reaction is going to proceed. Temperature also is going to increase our reaction rate for most reactions. Heat them up, speed them up. Um, if your molecules are moving faster, they're more likely to collide, and you're more likely to have more successful collisions, so the more energetic the collisions become. Again, we kind of touched on this one, the surface area of reactants. Exposed surfaces do affect reaction speed. So more exposed surface, more reaction speed. Um, and that is mostly talking about reactions that happen between two separate phases. So if you um, have, say, a solid and a liquid interacting, the more surface area you have between them, the greater the speed of the reaction. And this is actually, um, if you think about the blue bottle reaction that we saw, there was a reaction between the liquid and the air above it. It was only when we mixed the two that we really saw the reaction happen quickly. Let's see. So this is called, that, that space between the two is called the boundary or the interface. Uh, coal dust and a lot of metallic dusts are really um, reactive as opposed to just a piece of metal or a piece of charcoal, which is pretty interesting. Um, increasing pressure, we should be able to visualize in our head more pressure, more collisions between molecules, so that's going to affect the rate. Here's a trick though, if you had a vessel with a reaction occurring inside it, adding an inert gas is not going to affect the, the rate of the reaction, or the equilibrium actually, um, because it's not in the reaction mechanism. So an inert, remember if we're talking about all gases, gas particles react independent, or are independent of each other, I should say. Um, they each have their own partial pressure. An inert gas, which is not going to be attracted to anything else, is not going to affect the reaction that's going on in the vessel. All right, catalysis. That's the increase in the rate of a chemical reaction due to the presence of a catalyst compound. Um, and, of course, that we know what catalysts are. The important thing to know about catalysts is that they're not consumed in the reaction. So we don't really consider them a product or a reaction reactant. Um, we'll talk about those more later on, but they are not consumed and you can use them over and over. There's two different ways that catalysts work, and then there's a couple of catalyst types that we'll talk about. So catalysts can either work by stabilizing the transition state, thus lowering the activation energy. So if you saw this profile, adding a catalyst would actually make this energy acti activation energy hump a little lower. Um, the forward and reverse reactions are accelerated to the same degree when we do this, though, because remember, we have reverse reactions going on in the container as well. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind, and we'll talk about that a lot more in the next chapter of equilibrium. So the second way that some catalysts re 
act is by participating in the formation of a new reaction intermediate. So actually making a whole new pathway for the reaction to occur. And that's a new reaction mechanism. And in some cases that can really speed up the rate. Um, so we saw with the oxidation of glucose example, it's many, many, many steps, and each step is catalyzed differently. Um, so catalysts actually cha can change the reaction mechanism and speed up the rate over time. And then there's a couple of types of catalysts, and I'll talk about how different ones act. There are surface catalysts, and these are what we call heterogeneous. So the catalyst is in a phase that's different from the reactants, or not the same as the reactants. So a catalyst, a, a surface catalyst is going to be in the solid state reacting with something in the liquid or the, the gas state. And surface catalysts can work by either of those mechanisms that we discussed before. Catalytic converters in cars are surface catalysts. So we've got a solid surface, and it contains the catalyst, and I don't even know what it is exactly, but it speeds up um, the conversion of exhaust products that are harmful into exhaust products that are not so harmful. So we know that um, nitrogen oxides, which contribute to acid rain, Hydrocarbons and carbon monoxides are all really not good things that can come out of your cars. Catalytic converters help convert some of those into less dangerous products. Um, even though we know CO2 is not good for the environment and the conversion is not 100%, uh, it is helpful. All right, enzyme catalysts, we know about these. These are our biological catalysts. They're in living things. They're really con sensitive excuse me, to temperature and pH. That's because um, enzymes are proteins. All those protein strands are held together in a weird 3D shape by intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are easy to overcome with changing temperature and changing pH, so that's why our catalysts, our enzymes, are so sensitive. And then the last or the third type that we're going to talk about are acid-base catalysts. Those are usually homogeneous, so they're in the same phase as the reactants, and they're generally in solution. And this is when the acid, the reactant either gains or loses a proton from the acid or base, and that affects the reaction rate. Again, we'll talk more about this as we get into acids and bases. And I think I must have that in there twice. All right, and the last couple of things I want to talk about in this video, <clears throat> um, here is how we represent catalysts in reactions. Remember I said it's not a product, it's not a reactant. We actually put the catalyst on the arrow um, to represent that it's involved, but it's not reactant or a product. And we could do a little AP can or a little organic nomenclature review here. This is called ethene because we have two carbon backbone, and then the ene ending means that the two carbons are double bonded. Ane, ethane, would be two carbon backbone singly bonded carbons. And then maybe you can use that logic to figure out why 1,2-dichloroethane is called that. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it here. And in this reaction, the type of catalyst that is shown, we can guess, our best guess would be that it's a solid, a surface catalyst, because FeCl3 is likely solid, and these guys are all in the gas phase. We can't know that for sure, but that's the best guess. And then you need to know how to analyze these types of diagrams. So they wouldn't be labeled. You should be able to tell me, um, here we've got reactants products. Here, reactants, products, we see the activation energy hump, but it's been lowered in each case by a, catal a catalyst in the, the reaction. So you should be able to tell me which forward reaction is exothermic, and hopefully you recognize that this is the first graph, forward reaction is ex exothermic. Um, that's because the reactants are higher in energy than the products, so we see an overall release in energy. Which reverse reaction is exothermic? So here we're looking backwards. If we go from products to reactants over here on the second graph, we see same thing. Products are higher in energy than the reactants, so overall this way we see a release in energy. So that's a reverse reaction that's exothermic. Okay, and lastly in this video, when we start talking about reaction rates and getting into some mathy stuff, we are talking about how a reactant changes in concentration over time, that's what we see on this graph, or how a product increases in concentration over time. And the take home point of this is that a reaction rate is always measured as change in concentration, and remember that's the brackets, of some substance over the change in time. So the units, and this is the, this really important thing, the units are going to be moles per liter, because that's concentration, over time. So that's going to look like moles 
over liters times time. Okay, and this is where we will pick up in class next week. Have a great weekend.